At KeyBank, we understand what you need to run a middle market company. We bring a team of strategists and problem solvers to design and deliver solutions critical to your business's success. KeyBank offers industry expertise, investment banking and capital markets, payment automation, loans and lines of credit, plus equipment financing. Connect with your local KeyBank team. Learn more at key.com slash commercial. What's up, y'all? Welcome to the Rideshare Rodeo, gig economy news and interviews, sponsored by Para and ParaWorks. I'm your host, SJ. It's time to get it on. Welcome to another episode of the Rideshare Rodeo Audio Experience. Um, this week I have a guest. Some weeks I don't, some weeks I do. You guys know this, but I have a guest that we had on Para Presents, um, David and I, who maybe um, some of you audio podcast people didn't pick up on it. And also I'd like to just continue the conversation with my guest. My guest is Jeff Thomas Black. Uh, Jeff, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm glad to talk to you again. Yeah. And it's, and it's, and the timing couldn't be more perfect. You guys, I know I've been dropping a bunch of DoorDash stuff and I know people, you know, like I'm not following trends that are going to make, I'm, I'm not following trends just to be on top of that trend. I'm following trends that I think are very important. And right now there is a big, big new ways of deactivation and mass deactivations and all kinds of things with DoorDash that we need to get into a little bit because it's definitely not fair. I have this episode for all of you. You probably saw the name when you clicked it. It's called Dash Closure. It doesn't mean we'll have every answer, but I just want to expose some of, and I'm sure Jeff will add in too, some of the loopholes we've seen we that we know exist. And why is this this way? Why is there no oversight even within the company? All kinds of things. I mean, they can come up with a lot of excuses, but the bottom line is for the valuation that even to this day as they lose money that they still say they're worth mm -hmm. they should have people that can handle day-to-day -day problems when it comes to the workers and the customers and they don't mm. i mean i don't know like jeff i know you have a book coming out um i don't know if you have a date yet i forgot to even ask you i I, do, I don't have a date um it's a uh, the project grew exponentially just like the gig economy uh but I mean, are you still writing the book or are you just kind of oh, editing yeah. it now at this point? No, no. Um, mostly editing. Okay. But because, you know, I, I really enjoyed releasing the concept and doing the podcast and everything else because I take into this book everything that you're doing, everything that's coming out of, of the legislation, what's coming out of any organization attempts from the gig economy, and it makes the product, the book, ultimately, and the podcast better. Uh, the story is not over. It certainly has to come to a closing point so I can sell a book. But but I think we're actually kind of there. And, and by, by that, I mean what you were alluding to. I think the jig is up. I think that we've had, since the pandemic, enough time to watch this gig economy change and grow that we have now hit a precipice and the precipice is do we keep uh spouting the same stories and still play the same chaotic games of the of the doordash simulation and their fake ratings and their fake data and their deception and their their fraudulent business model i mean this is the bottom line is is this thing crept up into existence as pure unadulterated fraud yes. and because there are many 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 desperate people in the world that need to earn income 
And because getting a job is not something any of us can just choose to do, we must be accepted by that job. So what made the gig economy different is all of a sudden people like me, like anybody else, that maybe there's something about you that the place that you live just isn't that into and nobody's going to hire you. Well, all of a sudden you go out and hire yourself. And that sounds amazing. That sounds like freedom, doesn't it? Mm hmm. But what if it's not? What if it's a freaking trap? So yeah. that's that's where we're getting to is it's a trap. And and the problem that we have, Steve, and I'm going to, you know, this is full dash closure, is that there mm -hmm. are people that have been around for a long time, like Pedro, DoorDash, Santiago, like uh, like Kim's side money plans, like any of these these folks uh, that do YouTube gig app broadcasting. And the fact is they haven't evolved. And so what was once kind of maybe charming speculation or maybe, you know, Pedro DoorDash had some, some wisdom to share. Now I look at it and it's just this, this clown show of, of Pedro wavering in the wind as he tries to find an audience for his bullshit. And, and the problem with that isn't that necessarily Pedro's a bad guy. Pedro got trapped too right? There is no way to solve the gig economy equation because you don't have all the data. And so anybody like Pedro or anyone else that goes in, around and tells you how to work your market and how to work the algorithm and anything else is just full of shit. Whether they know they're full of shit or not is immaterial. There, they are, there are two things about corporate AI. There's, there's, there's a twin impossibility matrix, okay? And this applies to DoorDash, this applies to Uber, this applies to Lyft, everything else. A twin impossibility matrix. Impossibility means it's impossible. It can't happen. Number one, it's unexplainable. Nobody in the world, not DoorDash's top engineer, not Tony Hsu, can explain to you how the DoorDash system works. That's intentional, first of all. Yes. It's a benefit to the corporation, second of all. And third, it keeps them from having any accountability because at the end of the day, hey, Who's responsible? Nobody knows how it works. Now, here's yes. the other problem. Not only do not know how it works, even if we could find an explainer, there's nobody can, that could explain it to us. So it's unknowable and unexplainable. And so somebody like Pedro Dordas Santiago, who I'm going to call out real hard today because he, 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 uh, he blocked me last night because I used the word app slavery, which is, by the way, a very technically correct term. People work in these gig app corporate frauds for a loss of money, a net loss of money. I take a job, I go out and work for two hours and I come home poorer than when I left. If you can call that anything else but app slavery, I want your definition. And and so their concept last night, and it's on it's on TikTok, it's also on my Twitter, I, I shared that one minute because if somebody wants to call me out, they can call me out all day long, but I hope they bring their facts in their big boy pants because Pedro's been exposed. He's a clown. And so Pedro, my message to you is that slavery is very real and you're leading people into it. And so I'm kind of at my limit too, Steve, of being a nice guy and going to Pedro and going to all these other content creators and go, hey, you're lying to people. This is a game world. This is a simulation. You're lying to people. Whether you know you're doing it or not, you're lying to people. And so at some point as a civil rights activist, as a writer, as a person who cares about labor, you know, we have Vina Dubal, we've got worldwide experts all over the place that are telling us this is gamblification, this is rigged, this is abusive, this is exploitative. So I don't care if they have, uh, you know, a, a nice following on YouTube. I'm going to call these people out because they're lying to people. And who are they lying to? They're lying to the new people at the bottom of the pyramid that are going to get their pants fleeced off, ruin their car, not make any money and are now entering DoorDash in the gig app uh, world at the lowest point in history. And guess where it's headed? Lower yeah. to, brown, to brown kids on bikes. That's where it's headed. That's where they want this to go is to brown people on bikes because cars are too expensive and people that have had other employment opportunities in the past are too expensive. So what they want now is the 
least economically viable, least trackable employees on earth. And remember this, and I'm going to pass it over to you, Steve. There is an amount of money that must be earned from any one of these gig app companies before any information whatsoever must be sent to the IRS or any taxable authority. And I believe that's, is it $600? I apologize to the audience. I haven't looked yeah, for no, a no. while. I believe it's $600. Yeah, yeah. No, so, it is. so keep in mind, okay, if I'm averaging around, let's, let's be very generous, Steve, for a newbie, $15 an hour. Okay. $15 an hour at, and this is gross income. This isn't my expenses or anything else, right? This is just, I'm going to say that I'm gross and net $15 an hour. So how many hours would that take for me to earn $600? That would take 15 times 10 is 150. So that's four more times, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that would take 40 hours of work for the average person. The average dasher never completes 40 hours. The average Uber driver never completes 40 hours. The average Lyft driver never completes 40 hours. The average Grubhub and Uber Eats driver never completes 40 hours. So there's five different companies I could do 39 hours each from. So that's one, two, three, four. I could work five weeks tax-free without reporting it to the government, without employment statistics or anything else measuring me, hey, I could even not be a U.S. citizen. Who the hell's going to know? Right? Well, you I, could you could be anyway, because on Uber it, Eats, you can let other people use your account. Right. And so, so there's nothing I actually, I'm fine with people that are not U.S. citizens working. Let me, let me make sure I'm correct. What happens, though, is that when we employ people that don't have the right to work, they're further exploitable. This is just like, this is just like migrant labor. So if we employ somebody that doesn't have the full authorization to work in the United States legally, what are they going to do? They're going to work illegally on gig apps, just like you or I would if we were trying to survive in a foreign country. Hey, I've worked illegal in a foreign country before. I won't tell you which one so they don't come get me, but no, I've done but, it. But a, lot right? of, but a lot of people do that. That's right. Not, for those well, that haven't traveled, I've traveled the globe extensively with a laser company. And not that I had to do it, but I, I've... I've spent enough time in locations where I know this. This happens a lot, actually. And funny enough, do you know what happened to me when I worked illegally in Canada? The employer stole like $2,000 from me because I had no workers' rights. Yeah. And they knew it. And so isn't that hilarious that it happens to an old white American guy? Yeah, it wasn't as funny as I at the time. It's kind of funny now because that's exactly what happens to these other folks, right? DoorDash can just deplatform somebody, keep their money, and let's assume that this person doesn't have uh, the legal right to work in the United States. Their recourse is what? Nothing. Right. So so DoorDash is seeking victims. DoorDash is seeking app slaves worldwide. And Pedro DoorDash and these other ridiculous shills are their lead recruiters. So, uh, hey, Pedro, get a new day job, will you? On the just i have to play devil's advocate for a second because because no because pedro i can at least i can i can state this cuz i don't focus my content on doordash or this or that like like a lot of creators do i'm all over the map right. we're covering politics all kinds of things yep. but what i can say is that i've been doing gig work since 2014 kim and pedro both came in at the beginning of the pandemic they did so they came in at a time of like the gold rush mm -hmm. for food delivery yeah and when you come in at that time, yeah, it was the pandemic, but you know, are they, were you really putting the pieces together? Like, oh my gosh, the pandemic did this. Or are you just like, wow, this is really lucrative. And even if like you somewhat recognize it in the back of your head, you're still working going, man, I'm crushing it. And you're moving okay. along. And now it's starting to, I mean, look, we've been talking about this for a long time. Food delivery wasn't going to last forever. No. I mean, people got in habits over the pandemic, clearly. And those it's habits not, it's have not taken a, a while to die off. It's not a viable business model in the in in a day to day economy. It wasn't a viable business model then either. But no. we had a unique event in the world that forced people to adopt habits, and they are habits that they wouldn't otherwise have. Otherwise, have now the gig economy is desperate to keep those habits alive. Why do they want DoorDash drivers to not receive tips? Why do they want DoorDash drivers to earn as little as possible? Because every penny a Dasher earns decreases the demand for DoorDash services, right? right. So, so this is the thing about an independent contractor scenario, not that they're really independent in a gig app game world, but this is the thing about, the, about that scenario that is, that is so very powerful, 
right? Yeah. And I mean, again, though, with like, I'm a, so I'll be on, I'll, I'll hit on Kim for a minute. Like Kim, Kim side money plans works harder than anybody I know. Yeah, <laughs> she, absolutely. She really does. She goes in and puts I, 10 hours out there every day. She's making I have money. Been, and she's going through the day. So, I have been, I have been uh, both a fan and a supporter of both of them. And so that's where it comes out. I mean, Pedro took out, off after me and blocked me for using the term app slavery, which I believe is an academically and, and philosophically and, and correct terminology that being what it is and Again, even if it's I, not it's one that should be accepted for discussion sure well we have I, slavery can, we have prison slavery we have yeah. debt slavery i'm just saying you don't need to agree with that to allow that to be discussed right right and i wasn't it's, i was not trolling pedro either i said here's the problem if if you're in, if when we have employees right employees mm -hmm. and corporations by nature even if even if they want to minimize the cost of of labor, which most corporations or all corporations do, they have to move in the same direction. If a corporation moves without its employees, the corporation doesn't function anymore. Now, when you have a shell corporation that's just corporate AI and you have independent contractors, this corporation's only motive is that this goes the other way. This, the corporation can only benefit as the total compensation for the delivery function decreases and it's a delivery function. It's not their business. You're not their employee. They don't care about you. They don't even care if you're successful. They just want the share of the income and whatever else happens after that, it's all good. This is a global play for app slavery. They're in 27 countries. This is why they're willing to pay and lose money on every single order for Uber, for Lyft, for DoorDash, for Grubhub, for all these. They're money losers. Why would you lose money if you were establishing a monopoly on app slavery and the evil of corporate AI? And you yeah. want to talk about an existential threat. This is nasty, nasty stuff because people believe People believe that they have agency. People are listening to Pedro and other people that are telling them they can have a market strategy. They can do this. They can do that. Well, what happens? They ruin their car. They get in terrible car accidents. They find out Pedro and Kim were wrong and that Pedro is in St. Louis and, and uh, Peoria, Illinois ain't St. Louis, right? right. Mm -hmm. you, we're all markets of one. AI mm -hmm. is playing you like an individual chess match. And so Pedro is telling you, look, I can beat the chess computer in St. Louis. Who cares? Okay. Yeah, you're I'm not playing the chess computer in St. Louis. You're I... playing the chess computer on your phone. And so again, Pedro and others, maybe they, whatever their intentions are, they're grossly misleading people. Yeah. Well, I mean, one thing I can say for Pedro is I've heard him say many times lately, hey, guys, this isn't going to be your full-time gig. Start working no, on an exit says, plan. So he, he is says, saying hey, some, try it. But he's saying some things that are at least, I mean, but that's, better resonate with you because he's not that wrong. But that's worse because what he's doing is he's telling the he's telling his audience, which is mostly the neophytes and the new people, that this is a valid way to spend a few weeks, a few months, or a few years. It's not. It's a damn trap. What if you wreck your car in the first two weeks because you're looking at the gig apps and you're distracted on the road? I did it. I did it. And you know what? You know how many accidents I had in my life till I started DoorDash? Zero. Zero. And I was in my late forties. Well, you know really, that's really good. Had? I've had, I've had a hand. You know how many accidents. accidents I had with DoorDash? I don't want to tell you how many accidents I had with DoorDash. Because See, I'm the opposite. I haven't had any on the apps. I don't work a lot at DoorDash, but I do curry and the other, well, some of the other better ones that I consider better, but, um, but I haven't had any, but I've had a bunch before. <laughs> and, and physical injuries. So let's, let's yeah. do the math. So I used to go out and I used to start dashing maybe at about 6 AM and dash till about, 2 30 to 4 in the afternoon so how many hours is it? it's let's just call it nine hours on right. average okay so so in that entire time you get somewhere you get out of your car you're, you're waiting or you're sitting there you're driving so then you get an order you stop 
you get out of your car, you pick up that order, you get back in your car, you drive somewhere, you get out of your car, you take to the store step, you get back in your car, you drive somewhere, you get another. So if I'm doing, let's say, 20 deliveries in that day, and I often did 21, 22, 23 deliveries in that day, I don't think you could do that now. I don't think there's the volume of, of business to support that. But I would, do, I would do about that many deliveries in a day. So multiply each one of those by four. Why don't you get an old man in and out of his car, a low seated sedan for delivery packages, you know, a hundred times a day. My hip after about, after about a year and a half, my hip was so screwed up. I could barely work a walk because of getting in and out of low sedan. One out of every five Amazon delivery drivers working for the company, not as independent contractors was injured on the job in 2021. That's right. one out of five. That's 20%. So let's extrapolate that to this millions strong uh, gig app labor force, which is neither employed nor has any rights, nor protections, nor insurance, nor benefits, nor anything else. And we can assume that there are millions of on the job injuries for gig app companies that are not covered. This is a societal nightmare. It was created to destroy employment. It was created to enslave the lower caste of the United States. I'm going to have on a, a journalist from India in on the podcast in the next few weeks who will talk about caste discrimination, attacks, uh, brutal beatings, and even murders of gig economy workers in India. We've seen the same thing here in the United States. We saw a, a gig app worker in Florida uh, chopped chopped up into pieces by a psychopath who was delivering for uber eats we've yep. seen we've seen doordash drivers uh survive gunfire we've seen all of this this is absurd i and mean there's 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 disclaimers and warnings from wherever you buy a ticket from you know whether it be some online thing to go take a trip to cancun about not using uber in, in cancun because yeah. the Uber drivers are attacked so often, you're likely to be attacked. Right. And 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 so why wouldn't they be targets? Um, I mean, a, a cab driver, a 40-something-year-old cab driver was tragically murdered here in Portland a few weeks ago. That's a full-grown man driving for a cab company, okay? So you would assume he probably has even more experience than most Uber drivers or Lyft drivers. He was murdered on the job. Like... Would you send your college kid out doing this? Would you send your spouse out doing this? Your partner? Anybody that you love? No. So the answer to that is, well, then who are we sending to do this? And why is that okay? Yep. Right? This is this is uh, Juneteenth Day, right? We're recording yep. this on Juneteenth Day, which was mm -hmm. a day that is celebrated for the the fight against slavery at the very least, if not the attempt to end slavery. Yeah. Okay. And, and so what we've allowed while this is happening is these, this corporate gig economy cabal and make no mistake about it. They collude all over the world against governments, against legislators, against nations, against businesses, you name it. We've allowed this heinous corporatocracy that's funded by SoftBank and Saudi Arabian, Saudi Arabian money and Chinese money. I mean, these Americans uh, that I see on these gig shows and they're like, I don't want to be W2. I want to be independent. Okay. You're working for China and Saudi Arabia, friend. You're working for China, SoftBank and Saudi Arabia and Tony Hsu. How independent are you? Right? So I hope people are seeing right now that this is an atrocity, a human atrocity that is being foisted upon people. And so we got to stop right now. Are there people like you and me that may do this between now and when the gig economy implodes, which it will, because it's fraud. Yeah, there, there are. Okay. And so there's a cap. I'm not going to hold anything against you. If you personally go out and figure out that you can make a few bucks and feed your family in some way. But I'm here to tell you, unlike Pedro or unlike any of these other people, you're risking too much. You're not going to make enough money. You're in terrible danger. You can be trapped. And it is a net loss that you're probably going to face. Now, some people gamble and win, right? That's the thing about gamification. It wouldn't be gamification if everybody lost. There's got to be a few winners. And so you can ask yourself, why is Pedro a winner? 
well, just DoorDash watch the number one broadcaster and throw him some bones for advertising? You think they wouldn't? Come on. I mean, this is the thing. We believe that they have programs. They give us no metrics. Like, you're going to be a super jumper. How high do you have to jump? You you jump and you're a super jumper. Okay, so is that one inch or six inches? Well, we're not going to tell you that, right? So, so, I mean, again, they're not giving you enough data to even make a basic economically viable decision on any single order. That's the level of deception. They're deceiving you to the point that anything that you do is a flat out guess. Yeah. That's it. That's the best you got. And if you're if you think it's anything else, you're lying to yourself because they're giving you some number of seconds to solve an equation without enough data to say solve the equation. So, right. yeah. And as we as we discussed <laughs> before in, in rideshare, you have what five seconds to decide while driving on the food, deli <laughs> on the food delivery side. You have a minute. Right, five seconds or it a minute should, to if, crash if anything, your car. If anything, you should have a minute on both at least. But if anything, it should be reversed. I mean, they could five me, seconds they on could the food me. with all the offers they send you, but you should have a minute on the ride shares. You should not have five seconds. You're going to crash every time. Well, if I and I mean, it, it, I could give you 24 hours, and if I give you an unsolvable equation, you're still going to have an unsolved right. equation at the end of the day. I mean, it, which is it, why, which is why I really like the Colorado legislation: show complete transparency. And hey, listen, if it's if it's a nickel to do every trip, even even the people who are really trying and thinking I'll make it work will understand this doesn't work. The the transparency would end the gig economy overnight. If, it, if there was transparency, they would never get someone to pick up the passenger at X and take them to Y because the person doesn't want to take to go to Y. So they deceive the driver and say, just pick up and then we're going to send you someplace. And the driver picks it up and go, God damn it. Lost again. Got to go. Got to head across the bridge. And now I'm screwed. Well, that's, and I think that's, that's what Uber, I think that's what Uber's facing right now because they did the upfront fare yeah. so that you're yeah, seeing it work. all. And that's what we've asked for the whole time. Just be upfront and show me everything. And now that they do it, drivers are going, I'm not going to take that one. So right. what we've been asking for now, nobody's taking the orders. Right. It's a broken, it's not a real business model. I mean, a business model built upon fraud can't be solved. Now, the question is, and this is where our friend uh, David from Para, uh, who we had a podcast with a few mm -hmm. weeks ago, comes in. Is there a way to use technology to transparently and honestly dispatch drivers for tasks? Of course there is. Of right. course there is. That's not the gig economy. And right. that can't be the gig economy. The gig economy is corporate AI simulations and games that are only made to exploit app slaves. And I'll say that again, because that's what I told Pedro last night via text. The gig economy is created exclusively to exploit humans, Markets, app slaves, and merchants. That's it. It's an exploitation platform. And the fact that governments around the world have let it happen is your first clue to the fact that you're screwed. Because yeah. if the governments don't make any labor laws that have ever existed before in humanity, or any safety laws, any OSHA laws, any payment laws, any... Uh, any corporate responsibility laws. I mean, this 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 thing came out of nowhere, and now it's a global monster that feeds upon humans and and is a parasite on our economy. It's gonna die. It has to be killed. But well, also, it could, go the, it could go the other way and just enslave nations and enslave people to dictators. And corporate AI could be the way that. All lower caste people around the world are employed. That will be living hell. You won't want to be there. So my advice to everyone is to make much better decisions than Pedro or any of his ilk would ever tell you. And don't even dip your toe into the trap because the trap might kill you or eat you alive before you get out. Look, like any gambling, the winners are going to come out of the casino and tell you it was a great freaking day and I'm taking money home. Now, the 75% of the losers that come out of the casino are going to be looking down at the floor. They're going to get in their car. They're going to go home and they're going to tell their wife they broke even. Okay? That's just, that is the way humanity works with gambling. It's the way where humanity works with gig apps. We know these gig app creators are lying about the incomes that they make and the programs and their stars and all this bullshit. How do we know? Because they don't exist. None of these things have any metrics. 
None of these things have boundaries. None of these things have data. So it's all just imagination. It's all an illusion. Remember Doug Henning? It's an illusion. Mm -hmm. The gig economy is an illusion. It's an illusion of work. It's an illusion of a job. It's an illusion of financial gain. It's yep. an illusion of freedom, but it's none of those things. So I think it's a good shift now into the AI portion because I'm we're seeing mass deactivations like we've never seen on DoorDash. Yeah. Okay? Like just I'm going to pick on DoorDash specifically right now because the other apps, yeah, and they all gamify. They all have their ways. But like Uber's kind of been Uber isn't like shifting gears and doing a 180 right now. They're just going as business as usual. You just haven't right. noticed it. And we also want to make sure and note for everybody that Uber is is about 60 to 65 percent of the U.S. and global market. They are the gorilla. They're the standard mm -hmm. bearer. And they're very different than rideshare because since they don't transport human beings, there's really no standards whatsoever for vehicles or training or safety or anything else where the, the rideshare companies. Wait, you mean DoorDash? Doesn't... Right. Doorda I'm sorry. Did I yeah, say yeah. Uber? Yeah. The rideshare companies. You. They're responsive. They're at the very least involved in you picking up human beings. DoorDash is a whole different animal. DoorDash is the most purely exploitative gig app of them all because nothing is real and there are no standards, right? They'll, they'll let somebody with a car that barely runs or a bike or a scooter or a foot or whatever else. They don't care who takes the food or the package from X to Y. They just want the money and they want to be the local infrastructure for 27 nations. They want to be the postal service. They want to be FedEx. They want to be UPS and they want to be your food delivery. If that's what you want and that's the future that you want of a whole bunch of DoorDash ants driving around the world working for the upper class. Whoa, what an ugly future, man. So this is where some, some things become a little uh, wacky though, because look, when everything started, you could get a, like in the beginning of the pandemic, you could get a service agent on the phone. Right. Maybe, third, maybe third, even potentially third party, one. third but party. They, no, don't, yeah, they was, don't work for anybody. Right. But I was saying in the beginning, maybe even somebody here in the United States. Sure. However, it got outsourced. And now it's to a point where I don't even know that there are any humans involved in the equation. Mm. I'm sure. literally thinking the door. And again, we're, I'm just picking on DoorDash. It could be true to all of them, or at least it's the, in the, in the, feasibility of their pathways to go this way but i feel like they have 100 gone to an ai model where like you were talking about if somebody were gonna go why'd he get deactivated they can go i don't know ai did it of course ai did it there's no right human, right but there's we, no we just watching trained ai to deliveries. look for certain things i don't know why they deactivated it. we don't right, know I these these are uh, Sergio Avedian of of rideshare guy yes. was talking about literally the billions of deliveries with a b right there's no humans watching the details of billions of deliveries corporate no. ai is terminating people now why is corporate ai configured by human beings to terminate people that's the question because it's not doing it on its own right there are parameters in corporate ai unlike their fake programs in corporate ai there are real parameters now, let me tell you something. The sad part is, let's let's also differentiate employment from gig labor. In employment, Steve, I know you happen to be a lighting technician that travels around for countries. That is something that you and I, being relatively old guys, uh, you've spent many, many years becoming a professional at. You cannot be replaced. The I, If you quit a tour in the middle, they've got a shit storm on their hands. Oh yeah, they just can't get another. And it's not speed. even just. It's not even just me doing my job. It's me coordinating with everybody. Right, they can't get that another. That doesn't speed. get solved very easy. Right, because there's something that comes with experience, and we don't talk about labor and employment very often. So I'm going to throw out some terms here. There's called something called institutional knowledge. Everybody's worked when they had a W two job for a company where you just go to. Do you go to Betty in the back office because Betty's been here for forty years and Betty knows everything. Betty may be the administrative assistant for the president, but Betty knows what the marketing uh, program was in 1993, and she'll tell you, right? So there's institutional knowledge that is valuable beyond measure. The, that institutional knowledge, that humanity is what makes you, Steve, a valuable person. That's employment, right? Even mm -hmm. though, are you not 
Steve, kind of an independent contractor in those cases, aren't you? I mean, you're kind. Are you? I am, but see, that's but see, that's where the big problem comes in because I don't. I I I still to this day think, look, how long are we going to prolong just calling the gig econ- the gig app economy lot. something different? And it, right. and I don't know what its title is. It just needs a different title though. Don't gr- don't group it in with what I do for lighting and lasers. But they did it for a reason, Steve. That yeah, of course. That misdefinition of the gig economy as an independent contractor took the people that do what you do, the people that do uh, lighting and uh, set design and, and uh, I don't know, legal services, who knows what different things, plumbing, there could be a million types of independent contractors, but all of them sign contracts that are fully disclosed and legal. They're not deceived. They don't take jobs in Phoenix and then, then go to Bloomington, Indiana to do the work, right? They, everything is on the table when you do it, right? They don't, they don't give you a job to go on a lighting tour, Steve, and then, then give you a different job every time you hit a state, right? You agreed to a contract. You agree, you made right, an right. agreement that was fully disclosed to you. And if they change the agreement, you're going to go, whoa, 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 hold on. Here's the agreement. Let's talk about the gig economy. In the gig economy, somebody like me, 5,521 deliveries never to change, okay? I'm never going to do a nor- another DoorDash delivery. But 5,521 isn't, isn't, isn't a, a small number. That's, that's a lot of work. So my institutional knowledge to DoorDash is a full negative, 100% negative. I expect too much money. I've been doing it too long. I know their tricks. I know their scams. I know their programs don't work. And I'm never, ever, ever even going to accept a single order that would lose me money. I am the worst kind of dasher that could possibly exist in the gig economy, right? As are you, as is Pedro DoorDash and everybody else, except Pedro's a shill, so he's all right. So, well, I don't, so, I don't, I also don't count on the food delivery apps as much. And not to say that that ends the problem, but I actually work apps where <laughs> I'm pulling in some decent money. I try and do the last mile stuff. Right. As, as I said, like, so, so Para app is proof. Could you use technology to honestly disclose the information to have an independent contract with somebody that drives delivery? Absolutely. You could, right? Yeah. But, but but how are we what what were the what were the keywords and tricks and and riddles and illusions i just threw into that statement there were none i'm telling you right that we're going to make an honest agreement and you're going to have honest uh, an honest task to do so in the gig economy everyone with experience even if you've been doing this let's say 3 6 months right you get to a certain point in doordash and you figure out the scam you become less and less valuable to doordash every single day and so this constant churn of new people coming in desperate with lower and lower expectations, brown kids on bikes, people on scooters, people on foot, people in India, people in third in other countries that are not economically developed. This is all a downward spiral that is the intention of the gig economy. So it's it's designed to burn through human fuel. It's not going to keep you, it's going to use you and then it's going to spit you out, okay? And so, so humans have to be smart enough to know that for the rest of their lives, that is a tool of enslavement and danger. And if you don't know it, you better know it. You better know it because you have no privacy. They are tracking every move you make. They know if you're multi-apping. They know. And you guys, you even are. even outside the gig economy, as even you outside the, the gig economy, I was going to say, as you as you held up that phone, it was just reminding me of like that phone listening to you all the time. It, and, and I mean, it's it, running ads based on what you're talking about in your kitchen. Correct, and and so for for our friends like like Pedro or for for rideshare rodeo or for me i have a few you know on my on my pathetic little little youtube channel i have a few views for for all of us uh the the churn is is followed by what we call social listening and i write about this in my book right so so doordash and all these gig app companies and kroger and everybody else every major retailer in the united states 
virtually knows everything about you now, and they're all sharing it amongst themselves. So they know the groceries you buy, the medications you buy, the pharmacy products you buy, the personal hygiene items you buy, the medical care you have, where you're licensed, how you drive, your record, everything else. So the gig economy is walking people right down that path even further. And and again, the amazing thing about this is they're doing it with deception, not with not with uh, what we would talk about with with human sexuality, which is consent, right? Informed consent. If that if I was going to go use an AI system, what I would ask first and foremost, if anybody asked me to do that, is give me all the parameters, and I'll tell you whether I give you my informed consent. Okay. Right. What DoorDash and Uber and all these others are doing because they're fraud, because they're deception, because they're gamblification, because they're labor laundering, because they're app slavery, is they are holding that back, right? Mm -hmm. They are holding back asking for informed consent from laborers around the world. And laborers around the world then naturally, as humans do, anthropomorphize these gig apps and anthropomorphize these corporations and say, well, DoorDash is doing this and DoorDash is doing that and this and that. There is no DoorDash. Those support agents, nobody is, nobody watching this has ever spoken to DoorDash. They've spoken to third party support agents. There is functionally no DoorDash, not for customers, not for involves. The only entity of the triad that they talk about the delivery drivers, the consumers, and the and the merchants. The only triad of the merchants that ever will talk to DoorDash is a merchant because DoorDash is going to sell them down the river and take 15 to 30 percent of their of their gross sales. So to DoorDash, they want to get in the systems, they want to finance these restaurants, they want to trap all these local merchants into their heinous system as well, so that the local merchants don't make any money on the gig economy. So there is no aspect of this triad where they're not parasitic. They also screw customers, right? They're they're doing adaptive pricing. Oh, yeah. They're going to choose. They're going to charge you a different price. They're going to charge me a different price. They're going to charge grandma a different price. They're going to charge grandpa a different price. They're going to charge my little kid a different device if they happen to get on my phone and order a meal, right? Because they're they're all they're all being played just like DoorDash drivers by corporate AI, which can do millions like 2 million predictions a second about what you're going to do next, whether you're a driver, whether you're a consumer, they're constantly predicting what you're going to do next and beating you to the punch and giving you what they think you're going to want, what you, what you're going to see. So you're, you're getting a view. And I think I said this when we talked before, the world of DoorDash is a rigged game, gamified, gamblified market threaded through the eye of a needle. And then on the other side, whatever that little thread is poking the other side, that is DoorDash. That's a scam. That's fraud. That is a fake world where everything that happens there is to benefit a corporate AI system, which again, who supports that? SoftBank, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia China, uh, fraudulent uh, financial markets around the world and oligarchs around the world, that's who wants to enslave you. If you think they created the gig economy to give freedom and employment to the masses, that, I, I don't even know what to say to you. because that's absurd. Yeah, no, that, I think that, I think we all, look, if there hadn't, and this is such a hard thing to say, but if there hadn't been a pandemic, Irrefutable. food delivery never would have taken off. Irrefutable. It would have been, it, DoorDash was only in dense, economically wealthy, uh, yes. major cities that's yes. that's it that was and what it was, it was, was been really for. growing no of course i not. mean a little bit but i knew people who were doing rideshare who were like i'm gonna try uber eats and doordash and they'd be like man i can't make a dime on that and i live in denver it's a great yeah market. this was this was this was uh the gig economy winning their own little lifetime lottery the the pandemic was the greatest wealth transfer from the lower classes to the upper classes in history and the gig economy is uh the nuclear element of debt the gig economy is the end of employment and safety and integrity and accountability of corporations and if that's not terrifying i don't know what is because corporations are the ones that will destroy the world corporations are the ones that will drive the wars that will drive the prison industrial complex the military industrial complex all of those things and you know, I, I've seen many people say it. Uh, Sergio said it. I've said it. If you want your kids 
to have a have safe employment in the future, to be able to have a home, to be able to have a family, to be able to have a a standard of living. You don't want the gig economy because it's your kids are going to look back at this time and say, "What the hell did these people let take over our world?" And also, let's let's not overlook the fact. And I know this steps away from the gig economy, but right now there is there are some larger groups. I don't want to get too Illuminati here, but um, <laughs> and conspiracy. But there are some groups who are very much pushing for us to not own homes or cars and things like that right now. They don't want ownership anymore. They want us to not own a house. Mm -hmm. No, they want you to rent one. They do not want you owning. Um, well, that's good. That's good because none of us have the money. But <laughs> well, but I mean, but there's, but these are like Blackstone and some other things, right? That, oh yeah, absolutely. Black, or BlackRock and like, I mean, like literally buying up land that before there were companies buying them up, but they're just buying it up by by the acres now. Undoubtedly, those same entities are invested in the gig economy. I was going to say, I, yeah. I can say, I can say that with certainty. Yeah, right. Those are yeah. the same. Yes, they are looking to have a class of people that cannot work, live, eat, or have a home without the permission of a corporatocracy. Right. And so, again, that the the absolute tragedy is, I see the more right leaning uh, people in the gig app. YouTube community community uh, talking about W two jobs like they're a plague in the gig economy uh, of corporate AI as freedom, and unfortunately they couldn't be more wrong. Now was W two wage slavery the greatest thing ever, or did many of us you know no did did many of us hate our employers more than more than uh, more than the devil itself? Yeah, but. That doesn't mean that the gig economy is the answer. The gig economy is just another step down the ladder. And this is what happens is that people looking for the lesser evil, as usual, yeah, what's the lesser evil than W-2? Well, gig work sounds lesser evil than the W-2. Mm. It's not lesser evil, it's just evil, <laughs> okay? There is no yeah. lesser evil in gig work. And so, so... They say, don't make us do W. Nobody's going to make you do anything. You could be a valid, real, independent contractor, but it wouldn't be with the gig economy because the gig economy doesn't have independent contractors. It has app slaves that are being deceived, right? Look, so I, think in a, I think in a perfect world, and I'm, or not even a perfect world, in a semi-perfect world, I think that they would, I think this has gotten very, because what I'm seeing now, some of these changes and what we're talking about with DoorDash mass deactivations is, Full timers like Nova Dasher. Mm -hmm. uh, Marco's a friend of mine. Twenty one thousand plus dashes. He gets deactivated with a four point sure. nine nine rating. Only one contract violation in the last hundred. He had this kind of stats that you'd look for. In a but person. he's not. But he's not profitable to DoorDash. And DoorDash, right. DoorDash. DoorDash has social listening that accumulates everything that happens on the internet and gives them a daily report with thumbs up, thumbs downs, comments, trends, keywords, everything else. DoorDash is ultra aware. This is what their marketing department does, right? This, their marketing department analyzes data. They mm -hmm. analyze us. They figure out how to take better advantage of us, how to further pollute markets, how to take ver better advantage of consumers. This is the mission of DoorDash. I've received emails from people that work inside DoorDash, and they said it's like a scary cult because people are not the people that work at DoorDash are not stupid. They know they're doing pure evil. They know it's fraud, which is why they never talk. When has DoorDash ever addressed any of these allegations ever publicly? Yeah, well, they won't never. either. Even they if won't you get, even they... if you even if you get the right people on an interview or something, you're they're not going to answer your question. No, because, because it's going to look it's going to look like a Senate hearing because they can't. There you know, are no. Like, I, I'm not going to answer that. There are no answers. You the know. only answer is it's fraud. Now. Okay, so naked fraud. When will people figure it out? Which country will figure it out first? Who's going to put the first stake in the heart of the vampire? I don't know. I mean, but 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 uh, most often, scams can't last forever, right? And again, these every one of these companies is, is subsidizing with investor money every delivery and ride that they do. Why? Are they hoping that it's going to become economically viable in the future? No, the, the dynamics are not going to change. If anything, the prices are going down. So again, what are they monopolizing? They're monopolizing being able to control mass quantities of humans with only this. 
There's no employer. There's no employees. There's no HR department. There's no legal lawsuits. There's no uh, sexual harassment. There's no workplace standards. There's no hourly standards. There's nothing. In fact, hey, if we can make sure that most of them make under $600, we'll never even have to tell the IRS they existed. This is why I called it labor laundering, because it's the new version of money laundering. Right? Money laundering is using money in a way to obscure its sources, uh, 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 to obscure its, its sources and its destinations, right? Labor laundering is the same thing. This is a global labor laundering scam. Every single one of these companies is involved in a scam to use human labor without disclosing how it's really used, what it's really used for, and to what end. It's called labor laundering. I, I made it up. I, I, I'm very proud of that. It's a great term. And it will stick just like app slave, just like app colonization. What is app colonization? App colonization is international companies going into India and getting people to work for less than eight hours a day. That's called app colonization. That is a whole bunch of wealthy corporations <clears throat> exploiting people in India. Why can they do that? Because there is a lower caste in India and India is cool as a nation and a people with those people being exploited. That's how it works. America is cool with gig app workers being exploited. Watch some videos. Well, I, 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 can, I can say this. I got to be very careful what I say here because this is very fresh. But there is a new, there's a three-letter agency that nobody probably will think of which one it is, and I'm not going to say it, that is newly, as of last week, looking into some things that I had no idea. Um, just found out. Mm -hmm. And the way I found out was very, very strange. Um, but I found out from, I mean, like from a factual source too, is yeah. they are very, look at there, there are some people that have had it. Yeah. So, so on both sides of the aisle, here's the thing. Like I, I, no, I'm not, I'm not going to, uh, to, to pretend this even matters, but I've spent many years uh, researching this and I have a master's in business administration from one of the finest business schools on the planet, Duke University. And I've been in the corporate world and in finance and economics and, and marketing for, let's see, uh, 35 years. So I'm going to tell you when I use the term naked fraud, I would not use that term if it wasn't true, because I would assume somebody would sue my pants off, right? I'm a writer. I'm a public yeah. guy, do stuff, Right. You don't you, you don't call somebody you don't call somebody's business naked fraud if you can't back it up. Yeah, unless you don't you, you don't call something proof, app yeah. slavery. You don't call any of these things. You can back it up. I mean, people ask me to start because I was the first person to really come out and talk about these things. I'm still one of the only people that talks about these things. Aren't you afraid they're going to come after you? And I say, no, I wish because yeah. every single thing I've ever written or said about DoorDash, I can prove. Right, they'd probably I, rather just sweep you under the rug. Oh God, yeah, they're not going to. They're not going to be able to do that. But, I know, yeah, but you know they, what I mean. They absolutely. It's better for oh, them just to. I mean, it's better. It's better for them. I'm not saying it's a good idea, but it's better no. for them just to pretend you don't exist. Hey, I'm connected. I'm connected to about sixty uh, DoorDash executives on LinkedIn as a first person connection. So, uh, and they they read my they read my my stuff. So, DoorDash is plenty aware of me, and I've sent personal messages and exchanged personal messages with DoorDash executives uh, at at very high levels. So, um. I'm going to tell you, like, tell you, so there's no doubt this is crime, right? This is an international crime. This is fraud. This is, this is the money laundering and labor laundering are also crimes. Um, so, so, but in order for a crime to be prosecuted, it has to be identified. It has to be investigated and it has to be prosecuted, right? Somebody right. has to actually care to prosecute it. So far, the problem is that the constituency of people that do gig apps are in general, lower income, lower societal status, lower caste. They are uh, DoorDash and the gig app economy has, uh, has very predatorily gone after young people, women, and people of color because they know that those typically exploited workforces are ripe for further exploitation and they know they can get away with it. So, so yeah, I'm not surprised at all, Steve. And, and I look forward to that day. I've been telling people and I've written in my book, this is a scam that's going to end. It's a matter of when, right? It, it, because 
you know, no matter what kind of fraud you want to identify it as, uh, even if you just go to basic contracts, it's deceptive. It's dishonest. It's deceptive. There is no transparency. And how many times have they been caught in lies and fraud and total chaos? It's It's been nonstop, right? That's what the industry is. That's how they survive. Is the chaos. That's why they, people ask, why do they change the apps? Why do they put this new DoorDash uh, rating system in, in one place? And then there's another one in another place. And then they're testing another thing on Kim's side money plans. And then Pedro gets another thing. And then they're testing another thing in your market. Do you think those, that's a coincidence that everybody always has different programs? No, of course not. No. I, and what? in fact, I can give you an example on something is that Instacart, like, okay, the you know, Denver. Because sure. I know that you've right. been in Colorado. Yeah, so used, to live, used to live there. Hi, Denver. Love you. Great, Love great Colorado. Market, great gig market. Great if everything If you're going to be doing gig city. work. Right. If you're going to be doing gig work, though, it is a great gig market. Yeah. However, well, I, Instacart has never, ever been good here, even when it was popping everywhere. And I was, I'm very involved with Joel Shapiro and Dumpling, which is a complete, that's a, I got to tell you guys, if you're not familiar with Dumpling, this is not an app that feeds you clients. You have to find your own. This is a true run your own business app. That's what independent contractors do, though. They find their own clients. Did you know that? Yeah. And that's oh, the, th okay. that's the cool. thing. And then he created a marketplace <laughs> thing where they can find you. You have a profile page. It is literally run your own business. You set, you set yeah. your own prices. You do everything. Well, isn't so, it nice? Isn't it nice to see the flip side of what a legitimate application could be? Yeah, and I have I am on Dumpling. I have five I have five clients only. Nice but... job, nice job, Dumpling. I'll check you out. <laughs> yeah, I mean you should you should look into them. It's Dumpling.us. Everybody, you probably heard me talk about it before, but if you haven't, check it out. Look, um, we we are all into lifting people up. We are all into freedom. We are all into having the ability to support our families and everything else. So if we're if we're raining on the parade of the gig apps, it's not because we don't want people to be successful or have income. It's because those of us that have been around for a while truly see what's happening. And again, you know, as we're shedding people like Nova Dasher, who's got thousands of dashes, as they shed people like me who has thousands, as they shed others, remember, if that's what a corporation wants, is to shed the people that have done the most work and know the most, there's only one answer, right? What are they, what are they hiding? They're hiding the fact that the scam only works on new people. That's why this no trip, no tip, no tip, no trip bullshit and this this tipping and this hidden tips and this all, you know, Pedro, one of the biggest things that I've taken uh, that, that kind of switched me off of his train was that he takes great pride in denigrating people for whether for for how they uh tip or not in the platform and he calls them names and puts them down and calls them clowns and and he raises the hackles in this violent angry uh attitude that is intended by the gig economy companies to keep workers to keep gig app laborers and consumers at each other's throats so they never look at DoorDash. So so he buys into this crap and fuels it. And again, there's only one place to look. That's DoorDash, right? Everything that happens in DoorDash, whether it's tips, hidden tips, payments, non-payments, everything else, everything that happens is because DoorDash wanted it to happen, right? So, so his criticism is 100% misplaced upon consumers who are doing what consumers do and what consumers have always done. And so for gig economy workers to become anti-consumer, to become, to have this rivalry, it just give, it just puts gig app laborers further down that cast and societal listing because they're looked at as these creeps. And he talks about that, like, well, don't be a creep. Don't be this kind of dasher. Don't be that kind of dasher. You're representing us badly. No. We're all we're already represented badly. The, well, the and, general and public looks at gig app workers as the lowest form of employment, and they're kind of invisible people that walk the earth and do our errands. We don't want to talk to them. We don't want to look at them. We don't want to see them. We don't want to interact with them. And and so so we have to realize that if that's the view of the of what a gig app laborer is, 
Is that something that's a, that's positive for society? No, it's not. It's heinous. It's what will tear our society apart is to separate ourselves into economic classes and trap people in the company store in poverty, which is the gig economy. So just a, cu a couple other things we should go through here. I'm, I'm curious what's your take on, I, I do a show called driver nation with Tom mm -hmm. Kelly in Houston. Um, Tom is, Tom is very experienced. He's been, he's very involved with truckers. That's a trucker network. Mm -hmm. um, and so we talk to truckers all the time who part time in the gig apps. Look, the gig apps would love it if we were all 15 hours or less, there wouldn't be so many problems because right. if you were 15 hours or less, the, all their legal battles kind of go away too. Mm -hmm. Right. But unfortunately, a lot of us are moving more and more towards full time. Um, but all these articles that are coming out were it was this was just brought up to me and i again i hate it when things slip by me like when he said it i was like why didn't i notice this because he was like why do we need to know that uh, like an albuquerque door dashers this is today a door dash driver's car is stolen with his dog inside okay last week georgia door dasher locks her 22 month old toddler in the closet here's my thing i'm going to use that georgia story for a minute why in that Georgia story are they talking about the toddler? He's surrounded by trash in the closet. He's wrapped in a blanket. And then the, but the other details of the story are the fire department had to use a ladder to get in through mm -hmm. and then nothing else. Was it through a window? Did you go through the door? Where are the details of the story? Did a neighbor call about the baby? All of these are missing, but the title is Georgia door dasher leaves toddler mm -hmm. while dashing. Why are they running? Like you can take DoorDash out of every part of that article because the truth is, let's talk about the. It's about the person, not the, not the platform they're working on when they do it. That person might have worked at Seven Eleven and done it. So why is DoorDash? Why is DoorDash paying to have these stories written? Why is DoorDash planting these stories? Because, right, because let's be I've honest. Got, I've I think, got, I think I've most got proof of them know planting that, stories in Daily Dot. I, I, I was going to say I think that most people are aware. I mean, not all. Let's let's hope that some are legit, but most media is backed behind things just like politicians. So they can't run stories that maybe a good reporter wants to run a story, but he can't. Right, right, right. Because that 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 publication says, no, 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 you cannot run a negative on that company. Right. Which therefore is taking which really is taking that. This is why the news gets the bad rap all the time, because it should. That is correct. You should not be like, well, I can't report that's, on that's that correctly. Why, that, is, that is quite frankly why you and I have value, right? There are people there are people in the broadcasting industry that have financial and business expertise, but they won't talk about this. Why? Because they're corporate shills. They're pumping up the stock market. They're pumping up Tony Sue and the Stanford cabal and the startup garage and all the bullshit that they want to perpetuate into the future for their corporatocracy and their elevated lifestyle. Right. So you you are not going to hear this. Um, it's not what they do. Thank heavens, actually, for for the freedom that we have now with podcasts and YouTube and some other and other broadcasting channels that we can talk about the truth that others won't talk about. But, you know, again, this is this all goes back to the same thing of all of us having different versions of the app on our phones. The more chaos that DoorDash can throw into the world about DoorDashers being wing nuts and attacking customers and customers attacking DoorDashers and people eating food. They make it a cultural phenomenon, right? This becomes DoorDash has become, uh, you know, tabloid news. It, it really has. If you read most yeah. DoorDash stories, they're tabloid news. They're ridiculous things that happen with ridiculous people in ridiculous situations, right? People walking into stores and macing each other and throwing things at each other and screaming and, you know, all this absurd human behavior. And so what does that do? It takes all these people that are watching the mass media and they think and they go, geez, the people that work gig apps are a bunch of bunch of loony losers, Right. Bunch of loony homeless. But losers. here's but here's my point about the story that I was. I mean, there's tons of them out there, guys. Google DoorDash. You'll see mm -hmm. on the first page, you'll see some stories from today. And that, as and as soon as we as soon as we Google it, then DoorDash puts it in our feed and we get more of them. I found that for sure. Right. Right. Then but I'm going to send you more stories about DoorDash and gig apps being insane. Of course. But I'm I'm just pointing out that they're not. 
you look, you could take like out of all these articles, and I'm talking about hundreds and thousands and whatever. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if you take you can take every gig app's name out of those articles, and the article makes more sense without the the gig app name. But then how would they how would they establish that the cast is a lower cast? How would they establish that well, we exactly, are, but here's that we my, are lower class of human beings that are not employees? But here's my here's my catcher to that is that why aren't they even trying to cover it anymore? Why is this Georgia DoorDash story just about the toddler in the closet? Yet we have no idea how the police and fire got called. We have no idea why they used a, it all it literally said a ladder was used to get mm -hmm. to a balcony to go through the door. What? Put the details in. I mean, they used to put the details in the story, so at least it looks like you got some I, meat on the bone. I, I think what you see, and if you, I mean, if you look on social media, I think you're going to see that the gig economy is used mostly for clickbait, right? And yeah. when when something is used as clickbait, you know it's right. What and and we have to ask ourselves, right? Why are human beings? interacting in these ways, acting in bizarre fashions in gig apps? Well, I'm going to tell you the answer. It's very simple. They're being gaslighted. They're being made crazy by the gig app. They're, they're having misset expectations. They're being deceived. They're being sent around. They're being frustrated. They're not making enough money. They're getting in accidents and realizing that they just lost two weeks of income in one accident. And now how the hell are they even going to survive? Or like me, they could be dashing for a few years and have their water pump and their timing belt blow out and have a $2,000 uh, uh, auto repair that nobody can do for four weeks. And so $2,000 minus four weeks of income. Um, you want to be in crisis? You'll be in crisis. Like, Hey, five minutes. You just went from living a good, having, having, uh, money to spend and and uh, being able to survive to a shitstorm of both uh, no income and a two thousand dollar bill and nobody to do the work. That's the gig economy. That's the trap, right? Because any of us is a second away from an accident, even if it's not at work, right? What if right, you no, depend no, no, upon yeah. gig apps and you blow your knee out skiing? Well. What you I know? Mean, this this I is mean... why when I'm doing when I do last mile delivery apps and people are like you're killing your car putting that many miles on it for courier I'm like, bro, I'm like my car is designed to do the work. Yeah, you I would rather body. drive my car into the <laughs> ground and do highway miles and deliver product than be delivering people or or food locally because I mean we know the stat this is true any insurance company will tell you this that driving around your neighborhood is way more dangerous than being on the highway. It's one of the mo top 10 most dangerous jobs in the United States, man. It's yeah. more dangerous than being a cop. Way more dangerous. I'm just saying, even if you're not working the gig app, when you're driving, yeah. it's just you're in danger being on the streets, in, yeah. especially locally, though. Like when you're on your local streets as opposed to highway. That's that's why me, that's why I, who considered myself a very competent driver, once I started gig apping three and a half years ago, I screwed up my car royally. I think I did about six thousand dollars damage to my car over the time I dashed. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I have two more. I have two more things I have to hit on you with you. I Do need. To, I need to present this to you because I want to know if you've even ever heard of this. This is new to me. I hate mm -hmm. this. I can't believe this is a thing. And yet I know I, I have verified this. I know the person that it happened to very well. Um, and they've actually. I shouldn't. I didn't even need to ask them because I know them well. But they offered to show me every piece of this, and mm -hmm. they have. Um, they were deactivated by DoorDash. However, when they called, just like everybody gets deactivated, you try and call. Sometimes nothing. Sometimes somebody gets lucky. You get somebody. They put you back. Who knows? It's a mm -hmm. it's a crapshoot on what'll happen. But this was very odd. They told the person that they had. Uh, whatever you want to call it, a contract violation, a strike or whatever. And obviously they don't tell you what that is. That happened. You had one and uh, yeah, you are deactivated. However, they called it something and it wasn't a soft deactivation, but it was something along those lines where they can call in 90 days and get reactivated. Have you ever heard of this? No, but it makes sense. No, but it, it absolutely makes sense. Uh, because I mean, you, to me, that you're step, you're literally, you just said employee, right? <laughs> just, I mean, if that's the, here's my point. If that's the case, 
you should be, and I mean, we're not able to, cause we don't pay into the system, but you should be able to file unemployment for those three months because Absolutely. They, cause they're telling you, you can come back in three months. Okay. Really? But then cool. I'll, I'll get unemployment. You can't get unemployment. Well, and, and then you can't and, deactivate me temporarily. Okay. Then we'll deactivate you permanently. So, I mean, it's not, there's no win, but I'm just, I've never heard of them. This is a line I've never even thought they'd cross. This is weird. So, so there's a couple of things. So remember that during the, during the pandemic, um, there was uh, the situation where they uh, were uh, we where gig app workers during the lockdown actually did receive some type of of federal benefits the PUA. Uh, for employment or maybe even some yeah. state benefits the pandemic because, unemployment because so, assistance so is it, is it that weird that you know when the shit hit the fan yeah maybe they did get unemployment so you know mm -hmm. is anything is anything carved in stone not so much but so here's the answer right this this is always the answer in the gig economy the only rule is there are no rules so they could come back. Remember, you could come back in 90 days and they go, ah, we changed the policy. Now it's 180 days, right? That this is any time. Or you could call back and they could be like, who are you? you right. Exactly. I, I, I did that when they, <laughs> they, they, uh, they withheld and then held uh, a significant amount of money from me and never paid it to the source they were supposed to pay it for too. So uh, it took me many months and, 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 uh, a lot of efforts to finally get that money put where it was supposed to go. But the fact is it was literally impossible to ever talk to anyone that worked for DoorDash. So when there, when there are no rules to that point, when they can keep your money, they can keep your money forever. They can not answer your calls. They can do whatever. We have to realize what this thing is, right? I mean, this is a monster with no accountability, right? You're so again, I'm going to take, I'm going to take your friend's word for it that they told him 90 days, but even and I, that, and, do, and, I'm, do we, and I'm telling you, do we believe that? I, I'm telling you, he sent me the emails and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and, oh, and, I've seen it. I know. At, right. At, so that's a fact, but that doesn't, that's not a, con, that's not contractually binding that they have right, to give right. him employment in 90 days. Right. They can remember, they can deactivate any of us for any reason or no reason. Mm -hmm. Uh, a gentleman named Gig Geezer, who I think is a very credible oh, I know, I know uh, him. He's, source. He, come, he comes in on my yeah. last mile show. Yeah, and yeah. I've I've shared a number of his videos. He's a very credible source of information oh, about the gig economy. He does I mean, what Gig, I do. He does a Gig, lot of last mile services. And Gig, stuff. Gig, Gig Geezer pointed it out without a doubt, and there are articles to back it up, that the gig app and gig economy uh, has a racial bias, that more people of color uh, are uh, are deplatformed and and terminated from gig apps than other people and that there are biases built into this ai system as we know so this is a racist system as well uh which we should note since it's juneteenth uh mm -hmm. june 19th 2023 that the gig economy is racist Right. I mean, you, so might how well many, in, you, you might as well add in sexist too. Because. It's sex. Yes, it's it's sex. <laughs> it is sexist too. So, so how many, how many heinous crimes against humanity are we going to sit by and watch happen under the name of the gig economy, under the false label of independent contractor? Because independent contractor definition already existed. We know what it is. We know what it was. The gig economy ain't it, right? We can't allow them to redefine terms that fit their own purposes because that's not it. Independent contractors have to find their work. They sign, uh, they sign voluntary, fully disclosed, honest contracts, right? There is no part of the gig economy that that involves independent contractors, right? The only part that could possibly involve independent contractors is marketing lies. Is, is, yep. is, is marketing life. So yes, I have no doubt. And again, remember their goal is to keep anybody that starts catching on to their platform or anybody that becomes an unprofitable laborer, just get rid of them. And don't think for a minute that these folks won't start colluding with each other in terms of uh, deplatforming gig app drivers from multiple platforms at once, sharing information amongst each other. We know they collaborate together to fight legislation and any work, uh, work rules and protections. So, 
These are monsters. These are yeah, monsters. For those, These... for those not familiar, I'll quickly use Minnesota as an example, which I've talked about before. Minnesota had this thing locked down. I don't agree with the rate because they were using the same rates as Seattle, and it's three times as much to live in Seattle as the Twin Cities. Right. So no offense there, but I just think they should have kind of picked a better number. But nonetheless, House passed it, Senate passed it, went back to the House. This was all this going back and forth. And their their governor has never, ever, ever had to veto a bill. Right. He's always been on the side of it. Yet when it passed the House, Senate House, and went to him, they were like, when? And he spent his first veto ever. Of course he did. You know why he did? Yeah. Because, because the wealthiest people in the world are behind app slavery. The, let me say that again. But this the wealthiest this people a, in this the been, world. This should have been a state that went with it, though. This is kind of proof no. that if they're not going to, hey, it's like Colorado SB 23098 getting shot down. Right. So let That's this funny. let this let this be your lesson that the gig economy will comply with human decency and human rights never. Never. Yeah. They will buy off politicians. Well, and plus, they will like get we the first vetoes from anybody that ever gets. They remember, okay, so this is a gravy train. And if the politicians kill the gravy train, then the politicians can't be successful. So are they going to sell out farm workers and gig app laborers? Yeah. Right. Gig app laborers are just the new migrant laborers of the United States. And don't think there won't be gig apps for migrant laborers either, because that's where you're going next when you can't drive your car anymore. They'll have you gig apping in a field. So so let's just let's just make sure that we understand that what happened in Minnesota is the truth, which is people in power want you to be exploited. It's up to you. And that's the thing. This is individual action and accountability within a corporate AI system. And the only way you can save yourself is not to play. Yeah. Or you can play and be a rube and you can be a victim and you can be an app slave. And if you want to check out and uh, have no job security for your kids in the future, have no labor security, have no standards, have uh, people attacking each other in bodegas and in, in, on doorsteps across the United States uh, that are delivery drivers and consumers, uh, then, then keep this thing going. If you want a better world where people actually can have a standard of living that we can all accept as opposed to some arbitrary uh, financial compensation amount we can accept, which is what you're saying, right? Whatever it takes to live in Minnesota is what it takes to live in Minnesota. If mm -hmm. you're in Seattle, guess what it takes to live in Seattle? Whatever it takes to live in Seattle. And that's, that is the that's the terrible part. And again, I, I encourage people to uh, go to either R9 Media or my Twitter account, J Black. Uh, well, no, what's my Twitter account? Oh, uh, Jeff Thomas Black, LRB. It is not LRB, I T I S N O T. Go to that and read the article I published yesterday about minimum wage in 2023. There is no minimum wage. There needs to be a minimum standard of living. And if that minimum standard of living takes $35 in New York City, then that's what it is. And if it takes $21 in Minneapolis, then that's what it is. And if it takes $11 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, then that's what it is. But the fact is, if we want people off our streets, we want people that are disabled, elderly, young, old, or just a regular old human being not to be suffering on the streets in poverty and disease and misery, then what we have to do is figure out, figure out what are the minimum human standards that we have in the United States. Let's get people to live at those human, uh, human standards. But here's the thing. Here's the, here's, here's the upshot. And I hope this can be my final, uh, final statement here. If people lived at, at acceptable standards, nobody would work for the gig economy. Nobody, right? The only people that work for the gig economy do it because there's nothing else except for i would i would carve out that there are like curry and some of the last mile apps i do are completely transparent so i know what right. i'm so taking i'm i'm just gonna, there are I'm, some... just, I'm just gonna say curry and para and the other one that you mentioned those when i talk about gig apps those aren't i'm not even gonna call those gig apps because they have transparency and integrity a gig app is something that is served through as partial information that is modified. Those things aren't gig apps. Those are app, those are, those, that is technology that supports fair employment for humans. So good, good on them. 
I'm not coming after you. Keep yep. doing it. There are many legitimate ways to use technology to help independent contractors find better employment. It's including, not the gig including, economy. I, gotta, I, I hit on this often, but I haven't probably in a while, so it's a good time, including the internet, you guys. Yeah. For those of you who work gig apps, like some of the last mile jobs I find are on the internet, and they don't have an app. Right. You have to go find their website, hey, like U-Haul, I... and then you'll find some, or you or you go, or some of these other ones where it's like you go find posting boards, and you see, and you click on it, and it's completely transparent. Here's what you're taking. Here's where you're going. Do you want it? Hey, I had uh, I had some some folks that I delivered to over time that owned businesses that needed deliveries that paid me uh, on my own time twenty bucks a delivery to to do jobs. So you know you can absolutely get your own uh, independent contractor jobs driving uh, or delivering, and they will pay significantly more than you will ever make on a gig app. And you actually do have control of your work. So again, yes. And this is the thing. I want to say the same thing about the workforce. Okay. The low wage workforce in the United States and around the world, whether it's, whether it's migrant labor, whether it's manual labor, whether it's factory labor, that workforce has been around forever. That workforce has always worked hard. That all workforce has always worked with integrity. That workforce has always worked with pride. Okay, so that workforce is going to be is here now. It's always been here and it's going to be here in the future. What the gig economy is doing is using economic insecurity against that workforce, using corporate AI against that workforce mm -hmm. as a weapon, as, as a biological and nuclear weapon against humanity. That's what the gig economy is. So Yes to the workers, yes to technology, yes to independent contractors, yes to all of it. No to gig apps, no to fraud, no no, to soft, no, no. no to no oversight AI either. Right. Yeah, it, well, right. I mean, none we of got, that. When we talk about technology, AI is getting snuck in the back door. And we gotta, right. Cor gotta be right, careful, that, guys. That's why I say corporate AI, none, no, no honest business will manage people with corporate AI. Because right. corporate AI, by definition, is both biased and, and exploitative, right? right? Because that's what corporate AI is created to do. It's created to make money for the company. Nothing else. It's not created Especially to employ people. Especially if that corporate AI isn't outputting to the companies why, okay, here's why this person was terminated. It, like, in right. case you call, here it is. Here's the packet. Well, remember, DoorDash is a technology company. DoorDash specifically says they're not into the delivery business. Not uh, only do they not support- I'll question that, but okay. Not only do they not support <laughs> drivers, DoorDash, no business in the history of humanity has ever gone further to disassociate themselves from the people that do the operations in their field. DoorDash not only, and you'll find this if you when you call support, DoorDash not only dis, you know, disavows drivers, they don't know them. There's a reason DoorDash keeps almost no data on any driver. Because you know what? When the IRS and the FBI and whoever else around the world does come coming to DoorDash, they're going to go, eh, we don't have any data. You notice how your phone wipes all your past data, how, your, how, how DoorDash is constantly wiping data. And if you ever access, if you ever send into DoorDash and you say, I want my personal data, and you look at the amount of data that they're keeping on any one of us, they don't know us at all. Yeah. So this is, this is plausible deniability. This is a corporate entity with no accountability. With yeah. no human accountability. That's a dream come true, man. That's a yeah. dream come true for evil people. And uh, we got them. We found them. The people that want to destroy human employment as we know it and enslave humanity are here. And they're bad. We don't like them. So nope. this la here's here's this last question I have is that Checker. We got to talk about Checker for a minute. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Checker's playing a big role in everything going on here. I I have like literally talked to so many people over the years, as I'm sure you have too. Um, I failed. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> I don't think from now, from the from what I'm gathering from people, I don't think that Checker was doing background checks in the beginning. Like Uber was for Uber Eats because they were had Uber rideshare. So they just thought, oh, well, we just do this for everybody we onboard. So they were doing Checker in the beginning. I don't think DoorDash ever did because Checker is backed up beyond belief right now. Like you actually are on, like it's always been, they always have a, a flow, but right. 
it's always, I mean, some places can onboard you in a day, some in three days. Now things are taking a long time because DoorDash has almost or over 5 million dashers in this country now. All right. So whether part-time or full-time, for whatever reason, Checker is now running background checks. And what I've been hearing from people is if you've moved, if you've done this, that, the other, and I don't understand it because it's like, okay, I'll use my friend Mac, who's in your city, Portland. He sat with us um, in the the episode before Nova Dasher and was talking about his deactivation. He has 13,000 rides or, de- or deliveries. And his was due to Checker. He's from, um, he's from Boise. He now lives in Portland and has for three years. That's probably about, that's about five years of work, I'm going to estimate. Okay. So, but he's been in Portland for three years and he has 10 kids and a wife. He has his ID Mm -hmm. on DoorDash's platform from Portland. They've mailed him tax returns. They know where he lives. When they did the the checker background check, they never did one when they onboarded it. Mm Mm-hmm. Most of the apps do and always have since onboarding and whatever. DoorDash didn't. I think they escaped this for whatever reason, and now they're going back to it. But here's the thing. He got a background check. He requested a copy of it. He didn't pass the background check. And when he looked, they had all his Boise information. But they're like, where have you been for three years? And he's like, what are you talking about, dude? You have my ID. You, you, know, you can look and see that I only work in the Portland market. You know my address. You send taxes there. What do you mean? Where have I been? You you know you mail me stuff. You know where I live. You know where I work. Where? Except remember. Except here's here's the thing again. So if you if you know the data that DoorDash keeps on you, they don't know that, right? They don't keep that data, and there's a reason. Oh, why you is don't? Check, why is when you don't keep data? It's because you don't want people to come back and ask you for that data later. Right? right, but why does Checker not do? I mean, Checker's job—their only job is to do a background right. check on so, you. Right, so so let's <laughs> talk. About, let's talk about Checker for just a second. So Checker is like C H C K R, I think it's like a, it's spelled spelled strangely, or a C H E C K R. Yeah, um, it's a it's a company that is contracted by multiple gig app companies to do background checks. I failed a checker background check during the pandemic and it took me weeks to actually get on with DoorDash because I had, uh, as an activist, been arrested multiple times for peaceful civil disobedience. I've never been convicted of any crime still to this day. And so, but those charges alone, um, because charges never look good on paper. They never look good on paper because they're usually about 10 times more severe than whatever actually happened. So, So I was refused from multiple uh gig apps so my desperation quotient was going through the ceiling right getting the, during the gig app as i'm getting during the pandemic as i'm getting turned down for gaps so uh checker definitely background check me i saw the report itself it was an accurate depiction of my exploits uh but I also, you know, had to send sent them a letter, you know, referencing my attorney saying that I am innocent until proven guilty and that, you know, charges are not convictions, nor do they have anything to do with 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 what may happen. So Checker did at one time, I can most certainly say, check my background for DoorDash, and they turned me down uh, until I, I got back on. Now, today... Would there be a scenario where where DoorDash would tell Checker, just wave these ones through? We don't even care if you really do it. Of course, because who's watching? There are no standards, right? Again, because there are no rules, DoorDash can cut any corners they want to. And, you know, I'm sure it all depends, as everything else does. Just what Today, how does DoorDash demand more drivers in the app today to be sitting around on their ass waiting to take an order? If the answer is yes then maybe they tell Checker to work faster. If the answer is no, then they tell Checker to work slower. This is one of the things... Well, actually, this is you're hitting on something. Checker actually charges different tiers for how quick you want it. They give you the... There are different packages of how deep they go. There's just different tiers of how quick you you can expedite it. That's hilarious. So nothing is organic, right? So this is... The same thing goes goes for all aspects of, of DoorDash. So when you watch their engineering blogs, you will find that they can change the parameters in AI to make every driver on the road go 10% further to their next pickup. 
They can slow down a, an entire system anytime they want. They can turn off promotions on the consumer app to cut demand down. They can send out email. Uh, they can send out push notifications to drivers all over the entire area, telling them that there's a that there's a peak pay if they go out and dash now. Now they don't have to tell that to everybody. They just tell that to the people they want to motivate. So if you're getting the idea that there are no rules that everything they does do is, is about manipulation and lies. And you're right because they don't care if you make money, Steve, they will send you to do errands, which they know you will not pick up an order. They will send you to a restaurant to pick up an order, even though they know their restaurant is closed because they want you to verify that restaurant is closed. Is that, is that an independent contract? No. no and, that's, and, that's, and, in, that's, and in fact, we know of people who, have gone to these restaurants, follow their rules, cancel the order or getting their cancel fee and then and then get deactivated and they hold your money because they're like, why are you sitting at that restaurant accepting so, orders when you know they're closed? It's like, you sent me here, man. So what if, what if you know that there are no accidents? What if you know that there are no glitches? What if you know that every time DoorDash slows the system down or crashes your app, do you know they can make it take your app longer to load? They can just oh, yeah. slow down the load time. So people have no idea. DoorDash sets a target for what you or I are going to earn if we go out and have a three-hour dash. The, the, if you've ever noticed, I noticed when I dashed a lot, do you ever notice how you could dash for multiple days and your income would virtually be the same to the penny? You have, I, you I, never, I, never lived and breathe, I never lived and breathed to the food so, delivery space. I didn't really. So I have. So, I mean, I'm so, on all of them. Except so to be Grubhub specific, <laughs> because of what I was because of what I was studying and attempting to do, I only have ever done gig work on DoorDash because I wanted to know DoorDash inside out, frontwards, backwards, and completely. And mm -hmm. DoorDash is by far complex enough for anybody to try and figure out this scam uh, over a lifetime. So I never did any other gig apps besides DoorDash. So I had great consistency i door dashed i mean there were times when i door dashed during the pandemic 22 23 days in a row right so yep. you can be assured dashing in the same market 23 days in a row you can see patterns right and i would see those patterns see, this is this is impossible man you can't come out and average you know 22 dollars and 67 cents an hour four days in a row by coincidence that's just not going to happen no, and right? I think I think there's a metric. <laughs> I think there's a metric inside there that again, again, I, none of us know the algorithm, so I'm not going to pretend to. But I'm. I think there's a metric that like goes along with what you're saying. That's like, okay, he made three hundred dollars that day in ten hours. He's comfortable working ten hours for three hundred dollars. Of course, there's. And so let's let's just go back to the math because I think I actually misspoke on the math when we last talked. So the way to calculate this, if if there was simply ten, uh, fifteen drivers and fifteen mm -hmm. restaurants. The math to figure out the number of possible combinations for that is called 15 factorial, okay? That's 15 times 14 times 13 times 12 times 11 times 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, okay? That is the number of possible combinations of 15 restaurants and 15 drivers. You know how many that is? Over a trillion over 1 trillion combinations. So anybody that thinks that they understand how this app mm -hmm. is going to pass out the next thing it passes out, whoever it passes out to better belt, better be able to tell me that they can, that they can, uh, suss out, uh, offers out of a trillion, uh, combinations because it can't happen. That's why with that trillion combinations, that explains to you why with a trillion combinations, can I slow down, uh, Denver, Colorado's dashing 10% right now. Yep. I just turned the dial. Can I, can I speed it up 10%? Yep. I just turned the dial. What if, uh, what if I want, uh, what if I need more driver capacity on the road? I just turned the dial, yep. right? This is, this is a finely tuned rigged simulation. They can make it be and do anything they want and so when you're a dasher you know when you go out and you got that eye of the tiger and you're like i'm gonna work so hard today i'm gonna get as many dashes you can only do as many dashes per hour as they send you and you know how many that is no matter what you do till the end of time yeah two and a half to three maybe two depending on the I, day. I i say two always yeah you can, i don't you, know you, you might live in a rural city where you can crank them out a little depending easier, i don't know 
but but depending on how fast they you know they time you they send you to the restaurant early so that you wait the food doesn't wait that's part of their algorithm right is that your time is worth nothing food time is money right so they send you early you wait everything is about the food transaction so your time is worth zero and so so realize that that these companies absolutely have that ability to 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 fix everything you do again you can do two to three deliveries an hour under the best circumstances because of the timing they're sending you have to drive from x to y you have to pick up you have to do this right there's there's exceptions maybe sometimes you get four two mile deliveries and you can do four or five deliveries an hour right sure yeah, we, we've done it all. We've or done stacked, it all over, and over I don't time. count. I don't count all that stacked. But on on either. average, and as you'll find out, sometimes you'll do that, and then you'll sit in a parking lot for two hours and not get a single order, right? Or you'll so, get a hundred orders that you wouldn't take, right? So, so <laughs> with a trillion combinations, the end of the story is that none of us have any clue as to why, where, when, and how we're being sent to do what we're doing. We may be sent being sent to closed restaurants. We may be being sent to orders that are further away from us rather than closer to us. We may be sent on longer routes rather than shorter routes for delivery. All of those things, the, the, there's there's millions of predictions and trillions of combinations that are happening to control you. So yeah, you're an independent contractor. Sure you are. So I, I, gotta, I know I alluded to something earlier in this, so I have to at least give you guys a little piece. Um, this is the piece I can give you is that when I referred to a three-letter agency, what I can tell you, because if you're like, well, there's probably a lot of three-letter agen agencies looking. Mm -hmm. okay, what I can tell you about the one that I'm talking about and what I know now is that they are trying something right now that no other agency or state or any legislation has looked at. They are looking to put these under a RICO Act. Mm -hmm. and, there's, a there's a reason for that. I called it the global corporate cabal. Yeah, so I mean... If you're not familiar with RICO X, those are pretty much. It's organized crime. It's that's organized. What, that, crime. That's what I call it. I call yeah, it yeah, organized I mean, crime. I mean, it's, look, high, it's highly organized to give them credit. They're yeah, brilliant. And I mean, for them to even allude, and if you, and as soon as I am able, I will spill the beans because yeah. I just, I just, no, you know. You're, you're right on, Steve. I mean, that's been a common theme of mine for years. And that's why I call it app slavery. I mean, it's organized crime. But my there's, there's the nothing point legitimate there is, about this. If they're looking into a RICO case, that's how they're viewing them too. I would love to see Tony Sue and the other founders behind bars because they are criminals. They are they are global criminals. Yeah. I I just I think those are horrible, horrible people. And we all know, right? Any I've never met a dasher that thinks Tony Sue has not lied out of every corner of his disgusting mouth. Right. I mean, they DoorDash can't even have comments on in any of their ads because all they'll get is trolled, right? This is yeah. the thing. Like Everyone hates DoorDash. Let's be honest, right? It's it's just the evil that we know now, and we think it might be the lesser evil to a W two, but it's not. It's not the lesser evil, right? Well, I mean, I don't know. To me, hearing Rico just means that they have right. had it with the excuses. They've had it with the BS. They've Hallelujah. asked. They've asked for information and data. They don't get it, or they get packets that they're not asking for. Yep. And they're like, this isn't what we needed. We needed this. And they're like, oh, well, that would take us years to go through. And then they have excuses. Right. They're not, they're not into this anymore. They're, they're not, and they're not. And I think that the, what I'm specifically referring to should move fairly quickly. And so if it here, does, here's the thing. I, I don't think that, I don't even think they're willing to deal with them anymore. Here's, here's what I see potentially happening and and so if you read if you read the financial statements of doordash the 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 uh the annual reports you will see that their largest business risks are all regulatory they, they know this right they've been waiting for this shoe to drop since they started this global fraud now here's what here's what's really sad i would foresee a time when gig apps could be outlawed in the United States and those other 26 countries that DoorDash and their other global cabal monsters are fleecing right now will continue. And I think DoorDash is fully prepared for that. I think you see that in the way that they're positioning. That's the reason that they acquired Bolt services from, from uh, Sweden to begin with is because they wanted to expand to 23 other countries. They were only in four at the time, 
Mm -hmm. Right. So why did they why did they acquire Volt app is because they know, as they said, fraud and 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 scams can't last forever. Right. Because they're not built on reality. And, and sooner or later, somebody is going to become the wiser. Now, mm, now we could argue that that's been going on with migrant laborers forever and nobody still cares. But, you know, that's that's America. The fact is. The jig is up. Everyone knows. DoorDash knows. DoorDash knows this is their business risk. Their business risk is not their rate computer game. The business risk is legislation and oversight uh, 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 by governments. So um, I would absolutely believe there could become a time when DoorDash would be shut down in the United States, but will continue to uh, exploit India and or 20, 24 other nations. And there's going to be plenty. That's why they're investing around the world. Or even they'll be operational in the United States, but you'll be seeing DoorDash executives put in prison. That would be great. Here's the other thing, though. And, I wanna... and I'm not saying that'll solve problems. I'm just saying, don't be shocked if you start, because that's that Rico deal. That'd be they, get so... that re they put that Rico in place. And I'll tell you what, you're going to see cards fall like nobody's business. That would be that, that, Because will... that's where the government, well, no matter what you think of the government, I have my issues with the government big time. But no matter what you think about the government, when they put Rico in place, look out. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that is, that has that never is. been a screw around thing. There's that, in history, you can't look at it and go, that Rico case was BS. It's always very factual. Right, right. Because these are very complex cases. I mean, Rico Act was created for organized crime. It was the only way that they could get people that were doing all these hits and murders and, and cabals. The only way they could get them is to wrap it up into one ball and show that it was a larger conspiracy because they could never get anybody on, you know, any of the one little thing. So that's, that certainly fits the, the global, global gig app industry. So, yeah, I, I think this is going to be every national government is going to have this fight on their hands, but I, I would point something else out, right? Because this is power corporate AI in the form of DoorDash's technology, could control the workforce of any company, any nation, any dictator, any anybody. So if DoorDash is out selling this technology to people, even if it doesn't exist as DoorDash, this is technology that's made to exploit and control humans. So we're far from out of the woods here. I think this is a very, I'm going to tell you, I think as an economist and as, as a civil rights uh, advocate, I think we're in the very early stages of exposure to this gig economy, but the danger is far from over. The danger of corporate AI controlling human beings, even if they were called employees. If we made a mad, if we waved a magical wand today and made every gig app worker an employee, that doesn't mean that corporate AI wouldn't still exploit them. That just means we'd call them employees. And that's that's why I think people are so people's angst about W2 versus versus gig app is so misplaced. That's you're playing their game. It doesn't matter. Call it fair employment, call it, call it transparency, call it whatever you want. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't qualify for fair, safe, transparent employment, then don't do it. I don't care what you, I don't care if you call it a gig app or if you call them, con don't do it. If it's either fair, transparent, honest contracts, or it's a scam, there's mm -hmm. not, there's not two ways. So uh, we're at the very early start. Corporate AI is the danger, and it's not the danger because it's going to write your kid's term paper or it's going to take your marketing job. It's the danger because it has the ability to control the consciousness and actions of massive quantities of human beings. And it to get out scalable. of control of its makers. Absolutely. Scalable. It's already I mean, almost almost the, day, almost the day they launch it, it's gone. Right. It, the day they launch it, it is gone, right? We have the two impossibility, the two twin impossibility scenarios, right? It's unexplainable and it's ununderstandable. Right. And so, so corporations, remember, have always been characterized as metaphorical psychopaths. They have no consciousness. They have no feelings. They have no, no goodness. They have no badness. They exist for a function and it's to be a predator of money. Right, to so mm -hmm. take as much money as they can, and anything and everything that happens in that pursuit, that's okay with the corporation as a foundation, and then that's what we see here in the gig economy. And the fact, again, that our that our governments let this happen even during a pandemic, the fact that our governments let this deceptive, clearly dishonest, and and they've called it out, right? I mean, the uh, the uh, 
Federal Bureau of, of uh, Federal uh, Employment Bureau last year put out the statement that said these gig apps have shown that they're deceptive and dishonest. This isn't news. No, no. The NLRB, the, I mean, they're all. This isn't news. This is just the fact that we're not doing anything about it. It's, right. it's, it's, but, but remember the status quo has amazing inertia and there are a whole lot of app slaves out there that are going to fight like hell to stay app slaves, which blows my mind, man. Blows my mind. They don't know what they're signing up for. Yeah. And so, you know, all I can say, but guys is, is keep, keep watching, keep an eye out. Um, we will definitely, I, I know Jeff will, and I know David and I will too. David and I are going to be deep diving really into this three letter agency is the minute we can. And, um, and, and protect yourself. Everything you do, give your informed consent. If somebody wants to have sex with you. Okay. Do you have, inform, you know, give your informed consent or don't. If somebody wants you to work for them, give your informed consent or don't. If somebody brings you corporate AI, you know, you can't give informed consent. So don't do it. I mean, be a, this is like, te this is like raising kids. How do you raise your kids and tell them not to like get in the white van that says you can have candy? Don't get in the white van that says you can have candy. The well, now you don't even need to get in the white van because all these no. years that Uber said 18 and over, no one accompanied minors, period. Oh, right. Now they've said, "Hey, listen, we've done a we've done this study, and only twenty five percent of sixteen year olds in this country have a driver's license. It used to be fifty two, right? So now, oh, there's a lot of people not getting cars and not getting licenses. Let's just allow the drivers to make a decision whether the teenager can be picked up by them, the independent contractor, or not. And if anything happens, I guarantee you guys, and I know I've had a, this argument with a lot of people. They're like." Well, Uber says, and I called my insurance and they said, yeah, that, I know. <laughs> well, but no, but here's what people are telling me that have the correct insurance. I've called my insurance and I've said, Uber's now allowing teens. Cause I asked people to do this, call your insurance. Mm -hmm. They've called and they've said, no, Uber has you during period three. So even the insurance companies aren't on top of this because the insurance companies are on your side. They want your money. Yeah. So the, at least the they're on your side. They're also taking a beating from the gig economy and they're not happy about it. Right. But I mean, to, I mean, if I was an insurance agent, whether it be all state or whatever, I would even take my chances of being fired and telling you, don't ever put a minor in that car. A absolutely. I don't and care so, what Uber tells you. So again, this is, this goes back to the fact there are no rules. When you signed up, when everybody that ever did an Uber, uh, Uber, uh, task signed up for it, they were told that they would not have to transport underage minors and yet we got calls from my now you have time. to do it so we're, no we're but the... i used to get calls all the time and then even some minors would have the parent call me right. and the parent was screaming at me and i'm trying to protect their kid they're like dude just take him home i'm giving permission i'm like a i don't know you're the parent b it's my independent contractorship c i'm not letting them in the car they're underage it says i'm not allowed to take unaccompanied minors and even if i was i wouldn't do it you see, you see what a pain in the ass somebody experienced with with knowledge like you have, Steve. You just you're just not a good mark for the gig economy because you're not you're not falling for their scams anymore, right? You're not just taking the fact that they tell you you can do X and Y for for the truth, and that's what every single person needs to do. We know most DoorDash drivers are underinsured. We know most we know most rideshare drivers are underinsured. That's a terrible tragedy. Both, right. both for their physical health and for the physical health of others, and for their for their automobile and financial health. So this is this is God bless the RICO Act. This is organized crime. Uh, mm -hmm. I I uh, I don't know. I don't. I probably don't root for the FBI or the or the CIA or the. Uh, you, I trust me. When it comes out, you'll be shocked which three letter or, or the is. IRS. You, you hard won't. Enough, you, but... you won't. You won't. You won't guess it. You would never <clears> guess it. Hey, it could even be the CIA. This is international fraud too. I mean, remember, these companies are not funded by your by by Make America Great Again uh, aficionados. This is mm -hmm. this is by SoftBank. This is Chinese money. This is from the Saudi Arabian uh, royalty. That's who's funding the these exploits. So yeah, man, get them, get them. Right. I mean, for them to go after a Rico on some gig apps that deliver food though and such is speaking volumes well and, remember they're whole they're they are hiding billions and billions and hundreds of billions of dollars of transactions while they're labor laundering right they, they compute all of these companies compute the cost of their labor prior to even reporting net income so they are hiding 
massive amounts of material information from all governments and representing to them that there's this that there's this magic that happens outside their corporation that's bad for governments governments are not going to like that long time just like cryptocurrency right if if anybody thought that governments wanted to be replaced uh as the owners of the business of of making currency on the planet earth um they may have they may have uh, miscalculated because governments do not plan to give up the right to uh to establish your currency and tax you upon it uh it's going to be a lot of interesting times and and there i think there are lots of parallels between the gig economy and between cryptocurrency and nfts and all of these scams right there there are new things that are coming on that pump and dump and and doordash is a pump and dump right i mean their stock they, their their initial their initial offer price was what in the one fifties or one sixties or Suppo something and supposedly supposed to hit five hundred in a year right or two right and, and then and now it's in the what forties or thirties yeah. or something it doesn't matter but it's a fraction so all of this fits together all of it fits together yeah I mean yeah and it's it's just sad so um, I mean there's like like you said in the beginning we could probably go for ten more hours. Yeah, for sure. I mean, but this is so, this has been great. I mean, I think I think we spoke a lot of truth here, and it sucks because I, I'm going to tell you something. I, I do not like to criticize anybody on here. I don't like criticizing any of the YouTube broadcasters or anything else. But we have to be honest with each other with what is right. If if I look away from people that are on YouTube gig apps because they seem like nice, earnest people that that want the best for others. That's not the right thing to do because they're inviting, they're inviting the masses in to be victims of app slavery. And, and I think together, this community needs to start standing up and saying, okay, it's time for keep broadcasting, but how about we broadcast more truthful content, more honest content, more practical content about what's actually happening here, not what our gross income is as we drive around and chat with our friends. Cause that's just marketing bullshit. That's just marketing bullshit. And mm -hmm. And, and the only reason I care is because it's hurting people. You know, if you, if you want to go out and, you know, if Pedro wants to go out and sell his Pedro t-shirts, I don't give a shit, but quit leaving, quit, quit selling out uh, your fellow humans into app slavery. All of you, everyone don't do it. If you personally want to make the decision to do it, you do it. Don't, 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 no friend tells another friend to go work for a gig app. Friends don't turn other friends on to gig apps. If you got to do it, if you got to, if you got to, you know, dig out your sewer, dig out your sewer. There's a lot of shit there. You got to do what you got to do, but don't, don't go selling it to everyone else. Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, but you know, to, I mean, again, I'm going to use Kim for a second. You know, Kim's always trying to, she's not telling you get into this, do this. <laughs> But she's, she's misrepresenting she's saying, the impact saying, of your hey, efforts. Here's what I'm doing to combat what's going on. Right, but what she's doing only works for her, and that's that's where right. she that's right. where she misses the point is that she's broadcasting to herself. Nothing she does or says means anything. She's just broadcasting her own her own exploits, which is fine, but it's not extensible to anybody that's new to DoorDashing because Kim lives in Canada and she's in some specific market in Canada. Has been doing this for no, X no, number Kim, of years. Kim's in Jersey. Oh, it's Kim's in Jersey. I thought she was Kim, yeah, Canadian. No, no, no. Maybe that's another one's case. Sorry, Kim. You're in New Jersey. So, so she's been doing this, but it's not extensible to other people. So what if not, not that I'm the, uh, the coach for YouTube uh, broadcasters, but what would I love to see people talk about? Well, I mean, it's what you and I talk about. It's what Sergio Avedian and I talk about. It's what mm. Tim Carter and I talked about. It's the honesty about what this gig economy is and how it impacts people. Because when we put rose colored glasses on and when we talk about gross income and we don't talk about all the negative impacts on people's lives and socially, and then we're, we're spreading bad will against consumers and all those things, I think they're doing a very huge disservice to, to low wage workers across the world. And so I, I'd like to see them stop. And, and they will stop eventually because they look like fools already. They have to, we have to change with the times. We didn't know three years ago what we know today. Steve, you didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know last year what I know today about DoorDash, but I'm evolving with the times. I'm not going to give you the same advice that I gave you three years ago because three years no, ago, no. I didn't know what. See, when I go I... back, I go back to 2014 with Uber and left. Right. So I'm going so far back that I'm like, I have a whole story of, yeah, it's gone downhill, but not quite at the, at the rate of DoorDash, but it's still. Right that same type of problem.
so we, we have to be honest with each other, not, not for YouTube or anything else, but we have to be honest with each other as human beings so we can have informed consent, so we can have truth, so we don't get misled by corporations and scammers because we got to stick together, right? This workforce, all of us human beings that have been doing the work, doing the hard work, have been doing it since America started and before and, you know, our entire lives. There is nothing that the gig economy has offered us but human exploitation. And we have to be smart enough to see it. We have to, right? Yeah. We have to. And it's yeah. and when I say have to, I don't mean like, what if we don't, it's going to be fine. No, if we don't, you will pay and your kids will pay and humanity in the future will pay. And that really sucks. I'm scared for all of us. Yeah. Well, I think that's part of the timing of this three-letter agency too. They They are realizing that the churn rate isn't stopping and they're no. like okay listen if this isn't going to end even and people are people wise up and they leave or they go to part-time and understand but they're like but it's not happening at enough of a rate and too many people are getting into the system and and they're like so we need to get involved you know uh, and so like for the, again I, I again couldn't, for those i couldn't agree more know, for those that don't know when the word rico gets used you should shake in your boots not you gig workers but these platforms should. That is not to be taken lightly. It'll be a beautiful day. So um, as we sign off here, Jeff, what do you, where should people, I'll, I'll put everything in the show notes, guys. So if you're listening to this, you can find all Jeff's stuff in the show notes, but where should people find you? And Hey, just, just Google what's on screen. If you put in Jeff Thomas Black, full dash closure, you'll find me on Twitter. You'll find me at R9 Media. You'll find me on Substack, uh, Medium. I write a lot of stuff. I write about civil rights. I write about minimum wage, economics, housing. I tell you stories about when I went to jail and went in solitary confinement and was there on Father's Day in 2019 because I stand for my community too. So I uh, would love to share any of that writing. And of course, I'm very passionate about full dash closure because I think it's a civil rights issue for humanity um, that this gig economy has, has come into place. So, uh, yeah, just just Google what's on the screen. You can find me on any of those places. And I answer every message, every email. Uh, I really value the input from the gig workers. And I watch hours, tens of hours every week of gig economy broadcast because I need to know what's going on, good, bad, and indifferent. And so, um, yeah, hit me up. Talk to me. Tell me what you know. Tell me I'm wrong. Um, that'd be great, too. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would love to learn from what we have, but, but like I said, let's stick together and let's get smarter because corporate AI is new and, and Steve, you and I are kind of giving everybody the heads up. We've been through this a little bit, so keep your head up. Don't fall for it. Um, we know more now. Yeah. 100%. So you guys, uh, with that, you know, I'm not, I know that people aren't just going to drop off the platforms tomorrow and I'm, and I'm not even telling you to look, I mean, mm -mm. do what you got to do. And you do what you got to do, but just start opening up to what's the bigger picture. And if you know you're being deceived, if you know that everything they're doing is gaming you, then you can do what the only savvy dashers that I've ever known has done, which is never take any any order that is not clearly economically viable. Don't pay attention to their programs. Don't pay attention to their ratings or stats or anything else. If you get an economically viable order that you want to go deliver, take it. Everything else, turn it down because there will never be a reward to, to compensate for your loss. There will never be a reward to compensate for you even breaking even. Every time you turn that key on your car, you are taking business risk and human risk and life risk. That risk alone is worth something. I used to tell people, my car key doesn't even turn for under $7. It just, it doesn't even, it doesn't even move. I don't care if it's like, if I have to, if I have to drive 10 blocks and walk it across the street, it doesn't, it, 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 unless I see nine, 10, $11, the car key doesn't even turn because there's no reason. There's too much risk. Every time you drive down the road, you're taking business risk on behalf of a global corporation. And if you're not making money, you're insane. <laughs> if you're not making money and you're taking risk for global corporation with your car and your life and your work, that is really stupid. So don't do it. You can, you can beat the gig apps. You just have to refuse to play their game. Uh, yep. 
yeah. or, pl- or play Be- beats with, or the wrong pl- term you or can pl- you, or play with the right crowd you can you can play with the right crowd and protect yourself <laughs> a little bit in gig apps if you ignore all their gamification all their lives yes. and only take orders that that are clearly economically viable even with their deception so mm-hmm. but you got to do what you got to do right yeah. we're going to replace this system and when it goes away employment will come back one thing we're seeing when we see two massive soft bank projects just closed. One of them was a pizza place that was like half billion dollars put into it. Another one was here in Portland, which was a, uh, a food pod kind of a, a, a trailer scenario where they were producing food. That was another tens or hundreds of billions of dollars wasted. There's a reason they're actually shutting down some of these, these other investments that required employment labor is because they don't want employees. So you're actually seeing you're actually seeing corporations shut down and quit operations if they're dependent upon employees and that's because they see that if they go to the gig economy they can make the money without any of the responsibility and then they're literally printing money. So we've got a trend here that is really terrifying. There's th- this gig economy is Pandora's box. It's going to go one way or the other. It's either going to get shut down or all hell's going to break loose. Yeah. So, thank well, you, everybody. We are and, we are going to see some things, you guys. So just keep your eyes open, keep your ears open, and uh, yeah. Um, I know we ran over, but how can we not run over? So, yeah. uh, <laughs> um, thank you, Jeff, and uh, you pleasure. guys. We will see you back here next week on the Rodeo Audio Podcast. Peace, thank everybody. You. Happy Juneteenth. Happy June nineteenth, and. Uh, Everyone take care of themselves and your friends and your neighbors and your community. I'm